Our speaker today is John Paul Neary. He's been at Stony Brook a few years. He's doing condensed matter theory, computation, and uh, connecting with some interesting experiments. And he's going to tell us today about an ancient experiment, an ancient theory that deserves to be updated and improved. OK, thanks, Phil. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the temperature dependence of the X-ray forbidden to the reflection in silicon. I'm going to explain what this means in, in the next slides. But basically, the forbidden reflection refers to an intensity, which is plotted here in the Y-axis. And here on the X-axis, we have the temperature. And this intensity, turns out, decreases with temperature. It comes out from a, an X-ray measurement. And so here... There are experimental points, and the theory seems to agree well with experiment, but it's actually not well justified. So what we are, are trying to do is develop a proper theory to explain this plot. Uh, this is an old paper, as Phil mentioned, from 1974, uh, but, well, again, it's not properly justified. Uh, and also, we are trying to do it correctly, and then we intend to use a similar theory to what we're using now to do further uh, work in the future. So, well, first I'm going to try to motivate this subject. Then I'm going to introduce some basic solid state concepts for people that are not solid state physicists. I'm going to talk about X-ray, oh, sorry, X-ray diffraction and explain what the forbidden reflection is. And then I'm going to explain how the temperature dependence enters in the forbidden reflection. And finally, the conclusions. OK, so uh, X-ray diffraction is a very popular method to determine the structure of crystals. It's arguably one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. If biological molecules can be put in a crystallized form, X-ray diffraction is also useful to determine their structure. And actually, there have been 29 Nobel Prizes indirectly or directly related to X-ray diffraction or crystallography. For example, in 1962, uh, Rosalind Franklin and her student Gosling uh, made X-ray measurements for DNA. And while it's sort of controversial why they didn't get the Nobel Prize, which was eventually awarded to Wilkins, Watson, and Crick. And also it was awarded, for example, in 1964 for the discovery of the structure of cholesterol, penicillin, and vitamin B12 to Dorothy Hodgkin. And, well, and there have been many other uh, prizes uh, awarded to X-ray diffraction. Just out, like a fun fact, in 2012, the Curiosity rover in Mars used X-ray diffraction to study the Martian soil. Uh, and well, so this is as far as X-ray diffraction goes. For the forbidden reflection in particular, it turns out it depends on the valence charge. So basically, it's a useful method to study the valence charge and the symmetry of the valence orbitals. And as far as temperature goes, crystallographers or chemists may do measurements at different temperatures. They may have tables that are tabulated at room temperature. So they need to include temperature corrections to get accurate patterns and then compare to these tables and be able to say what structures they have. So well, that as far as the temperature of the forbidden reflection of silicon, this would be the, thir the three things, like x-rays, forbidden reflection, and temperature. And as I just mentioned, the theory we're working on will be useful to study further problems, like for example, pyroelectricity, how polarization ch changes with temperature, because polarization depends on the charge density. OK, so some basic solid state concepts that, well, people that are in solid state know all of this, but people that are not, this may be all, all new. OK, so in solid state, we study uh, crystals, which are, which are a periodic array or lattice of atoms. So these black dots here represents the atoms, or if you want the nuclei, and around here there are electrons. And so what does periodic mean? It means that we have like some unit cell. We can think of this parallelogram here. And we repeat this parallelogram all around space, and we cover the whole space. And maybe a little bit more rigorously, mathematically, it means that any point here, like P or Q, can be written as an integer linear combination of basis vectors A1, A2, and in three dimensions, there will be some A3 coming out of the plane. So any black dots 
which has a position r, can be written, written as an integer times a1, an integer, integer times a2, and again, in three dimensions, we have an integer and a3. So these are called lattice vectors. And well, it's very useful in solid state physics, as probably in your fields, to work in reciprocal space. So it's useful to define the reciprocal lattice uh, by introducing some vectors, k, uh, that give plane waves with a period of the lattice. And this turns out to mean that epsilon to the i, k, r, where r is defined here, is equal to 1 for all different possible r's. And working things out, it turns out that k has this form. An integer times a basis vector e1 plus an integer times b2 plus an integer times b3. So the reciprocal lattice is also periodic. And well, you have some shape that would be different in general from the shape in, in direct space. And as in any Fourier transform, the larger the a1s are, the smaller the, the b1s, b2. So the larger the, the unit cell in direct space is, the smaller it will be in reciprocal space and vice versa. Uh, so, for example, in the case of silicon, which is the material we're studying, it has the phase center cubic structure, which means having atoms in the vertex of a cube here, 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 here. And then in the center of each phase, like in the top one, there is an atom. In the, in the center of the bottom one, there is an atom. And also on the sides and then on the front and on the back. So we repeat this unit periodically in all directions and this covers all space. Um, and well, the, the shape, one has to work this out, but it turns out that the shape of the unit cell in reciprocal space is this truncated octahedron. And well, so silicon is actually not just this, but it's actually this, and then one makes a copy of this. So the green circles here are the yellow ones over here. So one makes a copy, one makes a, a copy of the yellow one and translates it one fourth along the, oops, along the diagonal like this, and one gets the, the gray circles. So they, here they just have different color to make it clear. So these yellow ones have an FCC structure, so this structure over here. The gray ones also, and they're displaced one fourth along the, the diagonal. And well, all of these are silicon atoms, and repeating this overall space, one gets the silicon structure. Um, okay, so, Another concept now, band structure. So as you probably know, for example, for the hydrogen atom, the energy levels are discretized. They are, you know, minus 13.6 electron volt divided by n squared. And similarly, if one has an atom in a box, energy levels are also discretized. If one puts more atoms, there will be more levels. They will interact with each other, so may change a little bit. And if one puts a lot of atoms in a box, having a crystals, the energy levels will be continuous. For example, in a metal, um, the occupied levels and, and the occupied and occupied levels are like right next to each other in terms of energy. So with that tiny bit of energy, el electrons can occupy higher energy levels. So that's why they conduct electricity properly. In semiconductors, there is a gap between the occupied and unoccupied energies. So that's why in principle they don't conduct electricity, but with uh, some energy not too big, they will conduct. And well, a more realistic diagram of this band structure has this form. So here in the x-axis, we have a path along reciprocal space. This is another shape for an hexagonal structure in direct space. The, the form in reciprocal space has this hexagonal form. So we follow a path here, gamma m l a. So from gamma to m to l to a. Following that path, uh, we have, for different case, different energies. And we have a structure of this type. Um, I want to do actually, sorry, this slide first. A little bit more technically, one has, how does the band structure come uh, or, or arise? One has the Schrodinger equation, so a kinetic energy operator and a potential that is periodic, uh, the wave function and the energy. It turns out that the wave functions can be characterized with two indices, n, a band index, and a electronic wave vector index, k. So it's sort of almost periodic, but there is a, an extra phase over here. And well, just as the wave function here has two indices, n, k, epsilon also has two indices, n, k. So in the band structure, one has the k index here, 
And then for each k, there are several, then, like this is, and it would be like n equal one, n equal two, uh, and so on. Uh, so well, this is the band structure of silicon, and again, this is the reciprocal unit cell for for silicon. Okay, coming back, uh, additional concepts, the ones of wave vector that I already mentioned and wave functions that I mentioned as well. So a wave function psi is a function that describes a wave, basically. In quantum mechanics, uh, well, it describes the quantum state of a system, and as you may know, the absolute value square of this wave function psi gives the probability of finding a particle, basically. And a wave vector k is a vector which points in the direction of the propagation of the wave. And the absolute value of k is 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. So this represents a, a plane wave. So it's a wave that moves in, so in this direction, and it's oscillating. Um, the distance between two peaks here, sorry, between this point and point, this would be lambda. Uh, well, in the case of X-rays, uh, for example, the wavelength oscillates in this range. So this would be uh, 0.1 uh, angstrom to 100 angstrom. And in the case of X-rays that are using crystallography, they are of the order of the angstrom, say 1.5 angstroms. And, and well, uh, and I mentioned this already, but in solid state, we use this type of wave functions we describe an electron. Uh, okay, so now how does X-ray diffraction work? So we have an X-ray that goes in, into a crystal. It has a wave vector K and a wavelength lambda. It gets reflected over the crystal and comes out with a wave vector K prime. And it gets reflected on one plane over here and then on, on the next plane as well. And we want this wave here and this wave here to interfere constructively. So one looks at the difference in the path between this ray here and this one over here. So and the difference in path is this piece over here, right? Because this length is equal to this one and this one is equal to this one. So the difference is d sine theta, d sine theta. And there have to be an integer number of wavelengths in that piece to have constructive interference, right, between this ray and this ray over here. So in this example, you see that there are one, two, and three, and four oscillations, right? And there could be one, two, or, or, or more. But in general, if there is an integer n number of wavelengths lambda in this length to d sine theta, there will be constructive interference, and one will have a peak of intensity, right? Uh, one can actually section or think of separating the crystal in different planes. So one can draw, put through the lines like diagonally, so this one here, there will be another distance d prime, but the condition will be the same one well, with a, a d prime over here. Um, there is a more rigorous approach, that is the von Laue approach, that it's equivalent, and basically it shows that the difference between the reflected wave vector and the incident one has to be a reciprocal lattice vector. So this approach is better to describe properly what are these planes. One doesn't have to be like looking at the crystal and figure out the planes. One just looks at basically, so the planes are basically given by the perpendicular to the vector k. And well, it turns out that k is two pi n, so n is here, d is here, divided by this, so these two equations basically, another one relate the von Laue approach to the Bragg approach. But the important point is that the one gets Bragg peaks if the difference between the incident and reflective wave vectors are um, a reciprocal vector k, which I introduced uh, earlier. Okay, so this previous slide assumes there is one atom per unit cell, but if there is more than one atom per unit cell, there, are, there is interference between those atoms. So one has to take into account that interference with using the structure factor sk, which is the sum over the different atoms in the unit cell, uh, of e to the i, the reciprocal lattice vector, and the position of the atoms dj. In the case of silicon, which has a diamond structure, as I mentioned earlier, the positions of the atoms in the unit cell are zero and one-fourth along the diagonal. 
For FCC, it turns out that the basis vector B1, B2, and B3 has this form, and plugging in this, this, and this into this formula, one gets that the structure factor is zero, even one plus n2 plus n3 is twice an odd number. For example, in the case of 2, 2, 2, 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6, that's 2 times 3, so 2, 2, 2, two is a forbidden reflection. It's worth pointing out that uh, in physics, forbidden usually means very small, not really, that it doesn't happen. I will explain now why it's not actually uh, zero, uh, or in a few slides. Ah, okay, so here I'm going to try to explain more graphically how this forbidden reflection works. So this is the FCC structure, and one can look, so this, these planes are perpendicular to the, this diagonal, this plane over here, and this plane over here. Well, and here I'm only showing one of the FCCs. But there's another FCC that is shifted one-fourth along the diagonal. So one actually has planes, another plane here that is a distance one-fourth from this plane, and then there is another plane over here that is one-fourth distance from this plane. So the, the, this blue plane would be this blue line here, this blue plane would be this blue line here, and the missing plane is the red one over here. So, uh, if the red plane is not there, one has for the 2 to 2, the difference, one has to look at this ray and the one reflected on the upper plane. And there are one and two wavelengths, the path difference, and that's a prag peak. But if then one introduces this additional plane, uh, one has to look then at this reflected ray. And the difference in path between this one here and this one here is now this. So it's three-fourths, three-fourths, 1.5. So there's now destructive interference. I don't know if it's that easy to see, but if we want, we can talk about it later. But basically now for 2 to 2, there is destructive interference instead of constructive. So there is a forbidden reflection. Uh, well, the previous formula, um, assumes, so this one over here is really assuming spherical symmetry, but in silicon there is tetrahedral symmetry. The silicon atoms are tetrahedrally bonded, right? Um, so that's why there's not really a zero over here, but there will be a, a small number. Okay. Okay, how does X-ray diffraction work, like an experiment? Uh, I'm writing again here the Bragg peak condition, and lambda equal to 2 d sine theta. This is like a, the parameters have to satisfy very precise, uh, have to have very precise numbers to satisfy this equation. So experimentally, one either varies lambda or theta. In this experiment, one rotates the crystal here, which amounts to varying theta. Here is a detector that collects the data and looks at the intensity. And here is the X-ray too that sends the X-ray and is reflected. So if one looks at the intensity as a function of theta, one gets a plot of this type. So here we have the angle, and only for certain angles, we get a, a strong peak of intensity. In the case, well, at the angle and this HKL indicate the reciprocal lattice vector have this relation. So two to two would be two square plus two square plus two square. That would be 12, should lie to the right of three square nine plus one plus one eleven. So there should be a peak around here, but we don't see anything. That's because it's a forbidden reflection. Uh, well, and again, it's not completely forbidden. It's very small. It's two or three orders of magnitude smaller. So that's why in this scale uh, we can't see it. Well, here's another example of like a quasi forbidden reflection, like in sodium chloride, because it's not the same type of atom. So was one FCC, the blue dots, another shifted FCC, the red ones. They have a similar electronic structure, so they sort of interfere a lot, but not completely. That's why we see a small peak over here. And in the case uh, of potassium chloride, uh, it's even smaller because, okay, it's a little bit small, but potassium is over here. So potassium plus would lie here in terms of electrons, and chlorine minus lies here. So they have a very similar electronic structure, and that's why the peak is even smaller. While, okay, sodium plus would lie over here. So the valence electrons of sodium plus and chlorine minus would be similar, but not as similar as for potassium chloride. Um, 
Okay, and next, how does temperature end, uh, enter in, in all of this? Ah, okay, so first of all, first of all, where does this temperature, temperature dependence come from? It comes from the vibration of the ions in the lattice. These ions that are moving interact with the electrons, and this modifies the electronic properties. Uh, there are different types. Okay, well, and a phonon is basically an elastic wave of, of, of the lattice, right? Um, so well, there are different type of phonons, as you probably know, like acoustic and um, optical. Well, since I'm introducing my work, previously we worked on how some of these phonons create macroscopic electric fields, uh, but silicon doesn't have this problem because it's not a polar material. So we don't have to worry about these phonons that create macroscopic uh, fields and have strong effects. Um, and we can actually use what is called an adiabatic approximation uh, in the expressions. Uh, maybe I, I'll mention that later. What, what is this diabetic approximation? Um, and well, our initial calculations uh, to calculate electron phonon interactions have grown a lot in the last two decades, so it's become more popular. Like in the March meetings now, there are several, several sessions on this, while it wasn't the case apparently one decade ago or something like that. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to try to explain what more detail, what do we want to calculate? Uh, which is basically the intensity as a function of temperature, as I mentioned in the first slide. Um, so I mentioned, uh, no, I, I guess I didn't, I should have mentioned this, sorry, here. The structure factor, if there are two types, more than one type of atom, one has to include, in addition to the exponential, one has to include this atomic form factor, which is the Fourier transform of the charge density of the atom. And well, and that's why there is not completely total interference because this factor will be slightly different for potassium and chlorine or, or sodium and chlorine. But sorry, so going back, uh, this is a more general expression than the one that just has the exponential. But more in general, if there's a continuum distribution, uh, it's actually the Fourier transform of the charge density, uh, and, and that's it, without separating it into different atoms. Um, well, X-ray scattering, the reflections, uh, take about 10 to the minus 18 seconds only, while a lattice vibration has a period of about 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So it's much larger, five orders of magnitude. So it means that when X-rays get reflected, they see like instantaneous pictures of, of the solid. Uh, so then, and well, these instantaneous reflections sort of over time uh, give a structure factor that is basically the same as just considering the reflections from the averaged uh, charge density. So these two are not exactly the same, but it's a, an extremely good approximation. And experimentally, we have access to the in intensity, which is the square of this structure factor. So the intensity is proportional to this integral over here. So well, basically, we have to calculate this time average, which in quantum statistical mechanics is a thermal average. So we have to calculate the thermal average of the charge density. Um, something that is used a lot in crystallography or Bragg's uh, peaks in general is this rigid charge approximation, which consists of separating the charge into the charge of the different atoms. So rho i is the charge of atom i, and it's centered in the position of atom i. Because rl is the position of the cell, tau i of the atom within the cell, and u is the displacement from equilibrium. Because of temperature, ions are vibrating. Well, and, and doing just some simple formulas, uh, some simple re rewriting of the expression. One gets that the structure factor, if ions are, are moving, are not in equilibrium, is given by this expression, which if you see, it's basically the same expression as before, but just as this extra e to the ik u. And when we do the thermal average, again, because it's what appears in the expression, uh, the thermal average of e to the ik u turns out to be one can show it's a property. Uh, e, it's e to the basically minus ku square, and this is very easy to calculate. So to a standard structure factor, if one wants to include temperature, one just adds this factor, and again, it's easy to introduce. Um, so, okay. 
I guess it's, it's easy to introduce uh, when previous theory studied this forbidden reflection, they also try to use the Weller factors. But they try to use the Weller factor for the valence charge. As I said earlier, the forbidden reflection depends on the valence charge. Uh, so they try to use a divide Weller factor for the charge that is here in the middle. So, I mean, if, if this represents the, this here represents the core electrons, so that is moving rigidly. So this is moving rigidly, this is moving rigidly. And what they say is, oh, well, the, if this is moving like, a lot like this and this a lot like this, here in the middle, it should move a little bit less, right? Because if they're going in opposite directions or stuff, this will be a little bit more stationary. So they say, okay, let's assume it moves rigidly with, uh, but a little bit less, this minor, smaller or equal than one means that these arrows are smaller. And they try to say, okay, it just moves rigidly and they try to get an expression. Uh, but well, that's not really the case because they, even though it's true that the charge here moves rigidly close to the nuclei, in the middle, the charge distribution changes itself. It doesn't move rigidly. Um, so what well, the previous theory, the, basically the last paper on the topic, tried to take into account that the charge density itself changes by putting a uh, temperature dependence, uh, by putting a divide water factor in the potential, but then in addition they added uh, so an, an additional divide water factor in the charge density. So this second divide water factor that they added is not properly justified. So they did get that the theory coincides with uh, the experiment, but again, it's not properly motivated. Uh, they assume that this 0.5 that they, they use is saying that these are, they consider an Einstein model, so I think they consider that it just oscillate randomly, and if you work the math out, it turns out that the point in the middle moves half as much. Uh, yeah. good, good question. Yeah, other people use higher factors taking into account slightly different models. Um, okay, so I, I, I'm going to try to explain more detail why this simple divide water factor doesn't work for the forbidden reflection, although it works for a standard drug peak and is used by crystallographers or, or chemists frequently. And this is because the forbidden reflection depends only by the charge only by the valence charge, because it depends on the charge that doesn't have spherical symmetry. So the valence electrons have tetrahedral symmetry in silicon, and as I just mentioned, so the charge here in the middle doesn't move rigidly, while the divide water factor that comes out here comes from assuming rigidity in this form. Um, while the core electrons do have spherical symmetry, so the electrons that are closer to the nuclei do move together with the nuclei. And, and well, most of the charge density is close to the nuclei. So even though when people put the water factors, they are not taking into account very accurately how the charge in the middle moves, it doesn't matter because it's a very small effect. Most of the charge density is properly treated with these divide water factors. But in our case, that all of the forbidden reflection comes from here. We have to take into account that it doesn't move rigidly. So the, like the full theory, so to speak, is needed. So well, this is our contribution, or the first part of our contribution, which is to point out that this previous model is not really properly motivated. And then, well, and then the theory that we use is just standard time-independent perturbation theory in quantum mechanics, also known as Rayleigh-Schrodinger perturbation theory. So we consider that each of the atoms, so it's time independent, we consider that the atoms are moved slightly from equilibrium. So the equilibrium Hamiltonian changes a little bit by a delta V. We consider delta V to second order in displacements. So we have a first derivative with respect to ionic displacements. U are the ionic displacements. And a term with two with the ionic displacement square. So L is the index for the cell in the crystal, I is the index for the atom, and alpha is the Cartesian direction. So L, I, alpha covers all the different uh, displacements in a crystal. As I mentioned earlier, the wave function square is the probability of finding, it's basically the probability of finding the particle. Uh, so multiplying by the electronic charge, it gives the charge density. And while we sum over all the bands N and over all of the wave vectors, um, so, well, the change in the density because the ions are slightly shifted from the equilibrium position 
is given by this expression, and using the, I didn't write, but the perturbation formulas from Sakurai, if anyone is familiar with that book, uh, one gets uh, a cumbersome expression which has terms with second derivatives of this type and terms of first derivative square. So it's this bulky formula, basically. So I, the details of this formula don't matter, but I just want to point out that we have the electronic energies that I mentioned earlier. We have the wave functions that I mentioned earlier. So K is the electronic wave vector. Q is the phonon wave vector. And we have these that are called electron phonon matrix elements, which involve uh, the electronic wave vector here and here. And it also involves, well, delta V1 that I was writing here. So uh, this, these are just some integrals, so then that involve the uh, electronic wave function, uh, electronic energies, and the wave function. So all of the terms are similar. But well, here we have a second derivative, and these terms here, here, and here are first derivatives. And uh, well, it turns out that the second derivative uh, is computationally expensive, so we want to get rid of that second derivative. And for that, we use an acoustic sum rule, which is to say, we have the crystal, we move all the atoms a little bit, and then we also move the, so we move all the atoms a little bit, we move the observation point, so we move everything together, nothing will change, right? So that's what this uh, equation means. Uh, doing Taylor, we have the derivative with respect to the first term, and the derivative with respect to the second term, omitting indices, you has the Li alpha indices, so there is actually a sum over here. Taking an additional derivative with respect to the ionic displacements, and putting all of the indices, we get this equation. So this part here has a second derivative with respect to the ionic displacements, while this one has one derivative, derivative with respect to the ionic displacement and one with respect to the, like, the electronic position. So basically, roughly speaking, we can write the second derivatives in terms of this first derivative, right? Working out the math, actually we have the second derivative here, which we write, there's, so zero is equal to all of these terms, so we can write this as minus this term, minus this term, minus this term. But again, the, the only important thing is that we can substitute a second derivative, which is computationally expensive, in terms of the first derivatives, which we have to calculate anyway. So we are using Abinit, it's Abinitio's plane wave software, it's developed maybe mainly by people in Belgium. Uh, it gives us all of the information that we need. It gives us these electronic phonon matrix elements that appear in the numerators of the formulas. It gives us the electronic energies, the phonon displacements, and the electronic wave functions. So we put all of this into the formula that I showed before, and we can, in principle, calculate um, this forbidden reflection as a function of temperature. Uh, as you can see here, sorry, here, we have a sum over many things. We have a sum over bands, here n and n prime and n prime prime, a sum over the electronic wave vector and a sum over the phonon wave vector. So, well, we don't really know how hard it would be to converge this, but we may need a, a lot of bands. Um, and, well, we have to see also the convergence in the electronic wave vector and the phonon wave vector. Uh, we're working the, currently working on that, and the objective is to get a plot as the one in the first slide, although we don't have any results yet. And I mean, it's basically all of the work will just be that plot, so uh, it's not finished, so right now I don't have any plot to show. Okay, so conclusions. The previous theory is not well motivated. It only has turns with the second derivative, uh, while turns with the first derivative square are not included, but they should be there. We write a second order, order perturbative expansion for um, the temperature dependence of the forbidden reflection, which should treat the non-rigidity properly. Uh, well, we are using this software Avinit to do the numerical calculations, and we expect to have results soon. So I just wanted to thank Avinit for the computational resources and for giving me the opportunity to show my research here. Thank you. Um, like, in Abinid, basically doing these phonon calculations, the energies 
calculate just the energies take, I don't know, say, you can say like 10 minutes, something like that, something very short. And doing a phonon calculation for a uh, material with two atoms in the unit cell, for example, and using this, the Q grid, the phonon wave vector grid of 18 by 18 by 18, using two cores here in ISCS, took about 20 hours. Uh, two cores with 16 processors per node. Okay. Two nodes, okay. Um, so yeah, some, some people in, in Belgium do grids. I did only 18 by 18 by 18. They did like 100 by 100 by 100. Um, so yeah, they do take a lot of time. Right. And then um, your, your formulas were written as a sum over states, right? You had all of these uh, indices on there and you had denominators. Yeah. Is that how you're calculating the result? Or right, yeah, that's just putting that expression in the, in the computer, basically. Yeah. And so, and, and so the expense of it will actually be calculating all the derivatives. It won't be computing your sum. It's yeah, the, and yeah, and the the thing is, we need such dense grids because of of these denominators over here, which if n is equal to m prime, and okay, sorry, in here that we have the q, if n is equal to m prime prime, uh, we need to sample this properly because it's a pole. So the standard thing to do is to put a plus i delta with delta of the order of the phonon frequencies. Uh, yeah, to converge properly this pole, that's why we need such dense grids. So, uh, you mentioned that you have a frequency dependence, you would basically add an additional one with this Um, that's sort of a way to understand it, uh, but yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that I mentioned before that we use this time in the um, adiabatic approximation. The thing is, these energy differences are of the order of electron volts, right, in a typical band structure. Uh, the phonon frequencies, like the largest phonon frequency, say 0.1 electron volts. So basically, these energy differences are usually much larger than the phonon frequencies. So you can usually just drop the phonon frequency; it doesn't have a big effect. In polar material, ah, I'm t I'm talking about semiconductors. Yeah. Uh, right. In metals at low temperatures, that you have the the sharp step from the from the direct distribution. Yeah. Then. And close to the Fermi energy, you do have to include the frequencies. And the other case that was only noticed like two years ago, that you have to include the phonon frequencies, is in the case of polar materials. Because you have these frolic polarons, you have these longitudinal optical phonons that create a macroscopic electric field, and it turns out that these matrix elements have a 1 over Q. So they, want to, they are like um, divergent. Th th this these terms are sort of divergent. Uh, so if you don't put the frequencies over here, you will get a divergence. So, so the first slide that you saw, which yes. is uh, the wrong approximation, it reproduces experiments really well. Yeah, but it's just, it's... I think you can get... Well, we hope, we hope to... But it's just, it's, it's, it seems like, okay, they, they've, I, I don't know how they thought about it, but it seems that maybe they put the first divide water factor in the potential, which is fine. Then they saw it didn't coincide with the experiment, and they thought, oh, maybe we're missing putting it in the charge density. So it seems like, oh, we put it so that it coincides with the experiment. What you're saying is that they... It's ad hoc. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know, may, maybe in other materials 
it doesn't come out to be right. Okay, I guess one could see if this ad hoc way does things correctly. And I guess if that's the case for many materials, one could say, oh, well, it's not well motivated, but if I want to just get a good, a reasonable prediction, it's maybe true, but it's just, it's just not the right way to do it. I don't know. Yes, they, they consider silicon and germanium, and I think, um, well, actually, I'm not sure about germanium. I, I, I could check. I, I think maybe it does. It, it is reasonable. It is better than, like, uh, I have it here. This divide water factor is just putting divide water factor equal one for here. Um, so that is what people were doing before them. Uh, so. That standard theory, so the standard theory of putting one divide water factor just doesn't work. Well, uh, in principle, regarding the shape, uh, I don't know. But in principle, yes. If, if standard theory would incorporate these fun terms, in principle, it would be more accurate. Uh, at the same time, this, um, how can I say? If one this does this rigid approximation, which is good for the core elections, then this would be basically exact. While if you just do the by water, like what we're doing, the by water and fun, that would be only like first order. So actually, what we are doing without noticing or using, I don't know, from experimental evidence or, or whatever, without knowing beforehand that the electrons move rigidly and we just use our theory, that actually would probably be worse for the standard black peak because it's just for order while this would be exact basically. So, so the answer is, well, our theory, I mean, it's actually the same, all the same, but our way of doing it for the standard black peak, I think would probably actually be worse. I don't know if that if was clear enough. Well, we are going to use how the charge density changes with temperature to study the pyroelectric effect. So we'll use it for gallium nitride. Um, so we will use similar things, but for another problem. I guess we could use it in principle to study for binary reflection of other materials if the data is there. Yeah, yeah, but our main interest is moving on to the, the next problems.